Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Hayes, and this is the first in a series of videos on intercultural relations. And being an academic, I got to start out saying, what is culture? I'm also going to talk a little bit about why we want to study it. So first of all, uh, a lot of what I'm going to go over comes from, uh, you know, the textbook I use in my course. And I, you know, I've thought about this stuff a lot, but I really like Gerd Hofstetter's work. And uh, he has gone on to have new editions and the latest one, he has a couple co-authors. Uh, so it's Hofstetter, Hofstetter and Minkoff, but this is the textbook I use. And so I'll have a full reference uh, later, but what is culture? Well, let's start with what it isn't. It is not refinement of mind, right? That's commonly used in Western languages, right? So we frequently think of someone being cultured if they you know, they like art and opera and that sort of thing. No, that's not what we're talking about. We have a broader sociological concept here that is, and basically what we're talking about is learned patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting that are shared amongst a group or category of people. So we're talking about what people think, right? How Also what they feel, what they value, how they act. And these are the learned patterns, right? That they've got. So Hofstadter, and one of the things I always liked about his work was that he talks about culture as the software of the mind, right? That's the subtitle of the book. These are mental programs, right? And it's collective programming in that a lot of people share it, right? They, they go through similar experiences and they learn similar things. And so they become this collective programming in many ways distinguishes one group from another. And like I say, it's acquired through a person's lifetime and not to get too much into child psychology or anything, but a lot of it is learned very early on. People are very open to ideas and they, they, uh, they internalize them very much as, as children. And so it can be difficult to unlearn what one has learned in one's life. So this is what we're talking about. Now, there are levels of mental programming. Right. Culture is not the only one, which is very important whenever dealing with culture in, in these questions. We don't want to truck in stereotypes and we don't want to be monolithic and say, OK, everybody from Quebec acts this way. Right. Uh, no. Right. <laughs> you know, not that's not the way at all. Right. We don't want to stereotype. And we don't want to say that culture is deterministic and the only thing that's going to affect a person's behavior. So the levels of programming at the base, we have human nature, right, which is universal and inherited. And at some level, people probably are more alike than not alike. We just notice the differences more. But so human nature is kind of the, the foundation. On top of it, we have culture, again, specific to a group or category and learned. Right. And then on top of that, we have personality. Right. And this is specific to the individual. The you, you have your own lifetime, right? You have your own unique life experiences and you have your own inherited mental qualities. And for example of this, you know, if you watch the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory, uh, he was he had inherited a dysfunctional level of intelligence, right? He was dysfunctionally smart. That was inherited. But he also knew a lot about football because he grew up in Texas and his father was a football coach. So he he individually had this weird mix, right? Uh, and so this is personality. And we always got to keep these levels in mind to not over attribute things to culture. What does culture consist of? The unwritten rules of the social game. All right, let's unpack that a little bit. The social game, well, first of all, rules, right? Uh, what do we mean by rules in a social game? And it's not that, okay, you're punished if you don't behave this way, but you know, if you're walking down the street and someone says hello to you, you, do you, you know what you're supposed to do right now, right? You're supposed to say hello back, right? And that's a rule. It's an expectation of behavior in a certain situation, right? 
we could call it a norm of behavior as well. But here, rules is what we're using. I'm getting this again from Hofstetter. Uh, this is his phraseology or their phraseology. And the social game is any kind of interaction, right, that we have going on. This unwritten thing is important, though. Sure, we could write the rules down, right? Emily Post, uh, you know, there's a lot of, lot of books that will tell you how cultures are. Uh, one of the biggest ones is a dictionary, right? A dictionary going back to, you know, uh, you know it, it, it's got, a, we're going to get to talking about symbols in a second, but a dictionary is full of symbols and meanings, right? For each sound or word, what does it mean? It's unwritten. I mean, the, the dictionary is unwritten, but before the word gets in there, the definition is unwritten and accept, but accepted by the society. There's some broad consensus. So when we add a word to the dictionary, it's already out there, right? It's not that we write it down in the dictionary and then it governs behavior. Like if you buy a board game and you open the rules, right? That's gonna tell you what to do. Those are written rules and you only obey them because they're written and you say, well, all right, we're gonna play the game, we're gonna do this. Um, these are unwritten, they're all, they, they evolve through human interaction in the society. So what are we? I already mentioned symbols. Symbols, words, gestures, pictures, objects to which groups attach a specific meaning. And like I say, a dictionary is just a big collection of these things. Heroes. These are persons who possess characteristics prized by the group, right? And I would add, <laughs> we can have villains too, right? <laughs> who have characteristics despised by the group. But these are people that, uh, are examples by which the culture venerates and they kind of agree, yeah, this person's great. And they become ways of teaching other people about it and sharing, you know, this, uh, this appraisal of activity, right? So heroes are very important. Then there's rituals, superfluous activities that are considered socially essential and are carried out for their own sake. That, that definition might weird you out a bit. Uh, but what do we mean by superfluous activities? Uh, Kind of the idea is, hey, activities that are really important, like, hey, you got to bring the crop in, right? That's not necessarily, that's kind of materially driven. What we mean by social rituals are, are in this context, we're talking about things that are expected, but not essential, not, you know, there's not a material purpose. For instance, a lot of folks are in the military. I was in the military. There are rules about when you wear your hat, actually, you might call it headgear, you might call it a cover, right? I'm just going to call it a hat because I've been out of the military for a while. So if you go inside, you're supposed to take your hat off. Go outside, you need to put your hat on unless you're on a tarmac. But see what I'm saying? we got rules. The, and there, it's superfluous. Right? Who cares whether you do this? But it's essential, right? You know, like, well, we have to have discipline. We have to do this, right? That's a big part of that's a, I mean, a good example of what we're talking about here. And I want to make the point, military courtesy with this regard, right? These rules are not weird. They're not unique to the military, or at least they didn't used to be, right? They really come from civilian practice. And if you go back into the mid 20th century, men wore hats. You did not go out so you were naked if you're outside with a hat. You need a hat. Women wore hats too, right? Being outside without a hat was frowned upon and wearing a hat for men. Women could wear hats inside, but men were supposed to take your hat off when you went in the building. And people, if you did, didn't, they'd say, what, what, what were you, born in a barn? Because you could wear a hat in a barn. Uh, but this was, we had a lot thick with the technical term here is thicker rules of the game back in the day. And so they have changed. So a little bit about rituals there. Values. Broad tendencies to prefer certain states of affairs over others. I kind of like that because you knew what values were. Did you have a sentence that you could readily grab and express it? Broad tendencies to prefer certain states of affairs over others. And here we're talking values that are social values, shared. And this is important. What's good? What, do, what does the society consider desirable? Although I've seen a distinction made between what individuals desire and what the society considers to be desirable. We consider, and we go back to that refinement of mind thing, we consider opera, ballet, art, a lot of things to be desirable, right? Socially desirable, uh, laudable when you like them. 
And then, you know, there's what you actually watch, which might be an Avengers movie, right? <laughs> and um, by the looks of uh, my my on-demand, you know, my Roku, I go in there, a lot more uh, things like uh, Marvel movies than there are opera and the like, but I could find it. I suppose I could find an opera in there if I wanted. Point though is, the society often shares a tendency to value some one thing over another. And then there's practices. Now, practices kind of cut through all this. And uh, Hofstetter, Hofstetter and Minkoff will talk about a onion model that values are at the middle and then rituals, heroes and symbols are layers that move out from it. Um, all of them, you know, more observable, but they're observable through practices. Practices cut through all the levels and practices are what we see. Right? They're the observables. And the important point that is made with regard to practices is we are seeing them. We aren't necessarily understanding them. Right. Anyone can see somebody, you know, somebody in the army going outside and putting a hat on. Right. Uh, only people who know the meanings associated will understand what that's about. Right. And the meanings are often not observed. And so that's something we, you know, part of what we do with studying culture is to connect up the things we see with the underlying meanings to try to get a better understanding of what's going on. Now, why is culture important? Most human interactions involve expectations of how others will act or react. Now, you might say that's a Captain Obvious moment, but I think it's profound, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, that, you know, we think about this, right? In your life, when you do things with other people, how much of what you do and how you conduct yourself is driven by your expectation or anticipation of how others will act or react. And therefore, inherently, there's this idea you need to be able to predict their actions and reactions. So you need to know about them. And I think this is just a very much a part of so much. And it's what distinguishes us in human activity in general from things like the physical sciences when they study particles or, you know, perhaps to a certain extent animals, although animals probably are starting to anticipate others as well. But, you know, it what makes it's what has agency involved. Right. And it's what distinguishes people from automatons like particles in physics, right? F particle in physics doesn't anticipate hitting anything. It just hits it. A human being will anticipate what others will do. And that drives a lot of behavior. So to be successful in politics, foreign policy, business, or just relationships with others, you must be able to anticipate, predict what they believe, what they want, and what they will do, right? This is my formulation. I think this is what we need to be able to do. And so, you know, if you're in politics, making decisions, managing a crisis, coming to a negotiation, you have to be able to understand what offers will be accepted or rejected. Will people monitor their agreements? You know, what's motivating them? Also, what's what do they believe about the world? Are Do you see things the same way? Are they looking at the future and seeing the same things happening that you are and thus understand that maybe this deal's better than what they would get without it? Well, that sort of thing. In business, when you sell something, you know, you're, you're, you're really very much anticipating someone will buy it, right? So this is just very important to uh, so many things, especially in the study of politics, political science, what I teach, you know, I say, look, the approach here is one, we want to understand the generic process, right, of that decision makers go through and what role these expectations play generically. And then we want to look at cultures and say, okay, how might our expectations be confounded by differences in culture, right? So I, I take a two-pronged uh, approach to it. Also, you need to know what uh, you know. You need to know what others expect of you, and what they believe, and what and when you're not meeting those expectations, right? So it's two-sided. Not only do you need to be able to understand what other people are going to do or anticipate, predict it, you need to. Th understand what they're predicting you will do and how that might affect the process as well. So there, and it's this, I know, you know, I need to know what you know, and I need to know what you know that I know. And, you know, we could go on and on with that. 
So this is why I think it's just so important for politics. And this is how I approach it. Right? We want to understand the process of the interaction, right? Of the decision making, the negotiation, the military planning, the business deal. We want to understand that generically and then model how culture is different. And it's always empirical. You always have to treat each person as an individual, each culture. You have to learn about that one in particular. But the study of culture can familiarize us with the characteristics or the dimensions of what could be different and how things could be uh, confounded. And kind of to be, not to be like Donald Rumsfeld, but to use his terminology, he, he liked to talk about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And a known unknown is something that you know you need to know, right? And so you go looking for the information. Uh, you don't know it yet, but you know you need to get that information at some point. The unknown unknown is you got no freaking clue what's going, <laughs> what's going on. And I think the, the study of culture is about moving unknown unknowns into that known unknown category so that when you actually are dealing with someone, you know what to look for. That's my take on this. So again, I promise a reference. The reference of uh, the textbook I use, one of them is uh, Hofstetter, Hofstetter and Minkoff. Culture is an organization, software of the mind. So there's that reference for you. Finally, just to finish up, I got some uh, disclaimers here. First of all, I'm Dr. Dave Hayes, and you can contact me at dhayes at troy.edu. Disclaimer, though I teach for Troy University, this video is my own work, and Troy has not reviewed or approved the content. The views expressed here are my own and do not represent the views of Troy University in general. So there. Um, if you want information, nevertheless, if you want information, the official information about Troy, Go to, go to their website at www.troy.edu or send me an email. I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, also, this relates to a course I teach, POL 4460, Intercultural Relations. That is part of Troy's Bachelor of Science in Political Science major and part of Troy's minor in Intercultural Competency. So there we go. Thank you for listening.